Hi everyone. This video is a sequel to my previous explainer on the first fundamental theorem of calculus, and now we're going to examine the second theorem. I really suggest watching the first video if you haven't yet, since we'll be using some notation and results from there. In this video, we'll examine three proofs that show how the two fundamental theorems are related and give a deeper insight into the connection between derivatives and integrals. Let's get started. While the first fundamental theorem of calculus is about taking the derivative of an integral, the second fundamental theorem is about taking the integral of a derivative. It says that if lowercase f is the derivative of capital F, then the integral from a to b of lowercase f is capital F of b minus f of a. The second fundamental theorem gives us a way to calculate the area under a curve, first by finding some antiderivative of the function, and then by evaluating f of b minus f of a. This result feels too good to be true, since the area under a function depends on its value at every point on the interval. How can the area be determined by only f of b and f of a? We'll answer this question with our three proofs, starting with a connection to the first fundamental theorem of calculus. Imagine I ask you to draw a curve on a sheet of paper, and the derivative of your curve must be the same as mine at every point. You're free to start drawing anywhere, but as soon as your pen touches the page, your curve is already completely determined. As you draw, the direction in which you're moving depends only on my curve, so you end up drawing the same curve as me with some shift in the y direction. Now imagine that my curve is an area function for some curve little f of x. You may not know what the area function is, but you know that its derivative is f of x by the first fundamental theorem of calculus. This means that big F of x and A of x must be the same, except that one might be shifted by a constant amount. In other words, big F of x is equal to A of x plus C, where C is a constant. Even if we can't figure out any values of A using our antiderivative, we can still use it to find the area underneath F on some interval. This area is equal to the change in the area function, A of B minus A of A. And when we calculate this in terms of big F, we see that the constant disappears. No matter how the antiderivative's output is shifted, we can still use it to determine changes in the area function, which is equal to the area under the curve on an interval. In my experience, this is the most common way to prove the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Though it's a simple and rigorous proof, much of the intuition gets lost when we just appeal to the first fundamental theorem. Let's take a closer look at what's really happening when we compute f of b minus f of a. Here we have an antiderivative for little f, and we'll find the difference between big f of b and f of a by breaking the function into small pieces. We can describe the total change in f from a to b as the sum of the changes in f on each little piece. We denote the changes in f as delta f and the width of the pieces as delta x. Writing out this equivalence, we can multiply delta f by delta x over delta x, but delta f over delta x is the average slope of f over one of the small pieces. If we take the limit as delta x approaches zero, this becomes a derivative of f. Additionally, as the partitions of the sum get smaller and smaller, we end up with an integral. Once we rewrite the derivative of capital F as lowercase f, we get the second fundamental theorem. I think this explanation is a great way to see how the relationship between derivatives and integrals leads to the theorem, but it still doesn't directly explain how areas are involved. This is why the last step about the sum turning into an integral feels somewhat unwarranted. Let's address this flaw by actually finding the area under a curve in our third proof. Our strategy is the same as the one we used when proving the first fundamental theorem approximating an area using rectangles. The area under the curve is roughly equal to the sum of the areas of the rectangles, and this approximation gets better and better as delta x approaches zero. This means that the integral is equal to this limit of finer and finer sums. Note that I'm adding the rectangles from right to left. You'll see why soon. By the definition of the derivative, little f of x is equal to the limit as delta x goes to zero of big F of x plus delta x minus f of x, all divided by delta x. We can substitute in these expressions for each little f, since we are already taking delta x to zero. Now something remarkable happens. The delta x's all cancel, and nearly every term in the sum appears next to a negated version of itself, 
these all disappear, leaving us with only f of b minus f of a. This proof really captures how surprising it is that big F of b and f of a are enough to determine the area underneath little f, despite the complexity of little f between a and b. Somehow, our giant sum turns into something simple. This is why the second fundamental theorem of calculus is so useful and beautiful. The connection between derivatives and integrals can be explored in many different ways, and seeing this from multiple angles helps immensely in grasping the extent of the connection. I hope this video exposed you to some new ways of looking at the fundamental theorem of calculus. The more you examine ideas from different perspectives, the more your understanding will grow. Thanks so much for watching.